Hey everyone, it's Dr. Mandy, and I'm here to talk to you about gut health from a naturopathic perspective. So let's get to it. If this is your first time joining, please click that subscribe button and like this video if you find this information useful. Today, I'm gonna to be interviewing Dr. Harold Magarinos, who is a Chilean dentist who specializes in oral and gut health. After over a decade of conventional practice and university teaching, Dr. Magarinos decided to pursue his passion to become a board certified naturopathic doctor. Dr. Magarinos specializes in gut health and how gut and oral health are very much interrelated and connected. If you've been struggling with your gut health, it's time to look into your oral health. In this interview, will help you understand all you need to know to help reverse some of your chronic issues. I'm honored to have him on today and I hope you enjoy this interview. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Mandy and I am here to talk all about gut health once again. You guys know I love gut health and it's really important topic really, especially in the 21st century. So I'm here with Dr. Geraldo Magarinos. Did I say that correctly? Perfectly. Perfect. Um, and he has a very interesting background. Uh, it's the first time I'm actually um, talking to someone who's a dentistry background. So um, I'm going to give you a quick introduction on himself and then I'm going to have him give us a little bit of background as well. So he is a Chilean uh, dentist who specializes in periodontics and oral medicine and surgical implants. And mm -hmm. after about 10 years of conventional practice and teaching at a university, he decided to pursue um, his passion and he became a board certified naturopathic doctor. So he does specialize in integrative biological dental medicine, homeopathy, live blood analysis, peptide therapy, and advanced clinical ozone therapy. And you guys know I love ozone, so love to hear about that as well. Um, he's been a long advocate for the study of the human with a firm belief that treating patients with dysbiosis has the power to prevent and reverse many of the forms of the modern diseases that we're seeing today. And using his knowledge and experience in this field, he's been able to improve the lives of hundreds of people who want a deeper understanding and address the root cause, um, which is a big, I'm a big proponent of, a, of as well, um, of your health issues, really. And so we're going to dive in um, and talk about the gut here. Thank you for being here today. We're really oh. happy to have you. It's my pleasure. Thanks so tell us me. about this dentistry background. Very interested to hear about what got you into functional medicine and naturopathic medicine yeah that that was actually a really cool story because um uh, i would not be here if it wasn't for dentistry and unfortunately of course the story doesn't uh start in a in, from a, a beautiful background uh, i was treating patients uh in the standard uh, way for for many many years and i would not see i was not seeing the outcome i was looking for and of course that hit me at one point i was looking for answers to get my patients better and i was using all the tools you know antimicrobials and all the standard type of medicine approach and i was not getting the results i wanted that led me to start seeking for alternative uh, solutions and i found a really uh, important root cause in the microbiome then of course one thing led to another i ended up moving to United States to finish my training on naturopathic medicine and working in this field. And this has been my, my passion for the, the past eight, nine years. Um, so it's, a, it, it, but it started from, from, from the, the traditional view that microbes are the enemy and that we have to kill them all. And the mouth cavity, of course, if you do that, and that's supposed to be the solution, you will see results according to those type of therapies and that was not happening and again that was definitely connected to the gut so the gut was also implied in this and then i start connecting the dots and that what is what led me to understand that everything has to be healed in a in a conjunctive way and to be able to to fix the mouth and gut issues all together interesting because we see a lot of people with a lot of really interesting dental issues and um even you know so as a gut 
gut and mouth access is really important and often overlooked as well. Um, and so we also do see that people who tend to, tend, tend to have not very good hygiene also have GI problems, don't they? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, it's, um, they're correlated. This is the entry part of the digestive system, grabs all the information from the outside. This is where everything goes into the digestive system, where we hold all this massive amount of information that is passed to the immune system, but everything starts in the mouthpiece. So if the information that is being modulated here doesn't come in the right way, of course, there's going to be huge implications in how we modulate the immune responses from a gut perspective. So, and then of course, that will affect the immune pathways, cytokine release and all these other molecules that will drive chronic inflammation. And that will affect the membranes and the tissues from the mouth as well. So you see that there is a correlation. Mouth disease can start and, be, and, and end by fixing both mouth and gut microbiomes all together. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay. So let's dive into that and how that's done. So the first thing is, and now we've talked at length about this in some of our previous talks, mm -hmm. um, we talk about diversity of the microbiome. And I do find it very interesting, um, you know, we're looking at the stool testing, particularly seeing the diversity being so down in this country. Um, and I'm sure that's probably a lot of Western countries are experiencing this. So let's dive into um, the diversity. Why is this such an important topic? And how does our lifestyle influence diversity and our diet particularly? Yeah, um, diversity is our strength, is our resilience. If we don't have a good amount of diversity, we're losing capabilities. Our metabolic pathways that are driven by the microbiome, they rely on having a good amount of diversity. So we have different types of information that it can be passed on into our cells so they can perform whatever they're needed. And also from having different types of microbes that they will be able to create the molecules and the pieces of information we need for becoming healthy. If that's missed, of course, we are started getting insufficient in, in our waste for modulating these responses or producing the things we, we need. And diet is a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, or the lack of fiber intake and other changes in our diet had, had been driven this lack of diversity pretty hugely. But also we have that environmental issue that is going and is increasing every single year. And average American is exposed to 700,000 type of toxins every single day and 80,000 types of chemicals. So the massive amount of exposure to toxins also is affecting our microbiome. And that, of course, lowers diversity in a very significant level. So it's hard even to bring those numbers up because the standard American life brings all these toxins into our life and organic foods and other things that we can use and not can be wrong, mm -hmm. they're beneficial. And definitely I encourage people to go in that route but they're not going to fix the, the main root cause that is that the environmental toxins are affecting everything in our body, our human cells, but also our microbiome. So that's when I realized that for microbiome treatments, we need to be detoxifying on a frequent basis because to our toxic burden can dictate the way that our microbiome will behave and will, will perform. And unfortunately, also the farming industry and the food industry is not really caring about that. And they're only looking at the human cell component. And if that is partially tested safe for human consumption, it's okay. And they're not looking and they're not obligated to see the mouth, to see the microbiome perspective of, of the things they're putting in our, in our foods. Wow. So is there, um, is there a hope for us? Um, as far as you mentioned detoxification. So, um, and we'll dive into how, you know, think what things people can do to just generally on a regular basis. You mentioned organic food. That's all, obviously none of us can farm and grow our, our own food. Um, but if they can, that'd be great. I always tell people, if you can grow something outside, you just try like even with a few vegetables, it'll make a big difference. Um, anything else people can do at home that would help. Yeah. I mean, uh, Definitely now that everything has, has turned online and most people, a lot of people are working now from 
outside their offices, they're working from home. Um, I always encourage to look for places that they're less polluted, less um, uh, crowded, uh, away from these very clear sources of toxins. But that's, of course, sometimes something that is not achievable. On the daily basis, I think that we need to rely on things that we know they're going to be chelating and, and, and removing toxins uh, without, without having to go into a very strong detoxification protocol. That's something that it needs to be supervised. But we know that that leafy greens and we know certain foods can, uh, they have molecules that combine uh, toxins. And actually, a lot of people are discussing about these molecules because they say, well, they're chelating minerals and vitamins. Yes, true, but that's where we have to find the sweet spot because also they can bind and eliminate toxins out of our bodies. So uh, we have so many narrow-sighted views in terms of the approach of diet in in a daily basis detoxification, and we need to see the broad spectrum. And the broad spectrum is that every single food in the planet, it was properly harvested or grown will have some benefits in terms of keeping us clean and moving these things out. The other imp huge factor is exercise. We know that that alone is, it can create a night and day situation between increasing the toxic burden or eliminating toxins properly. That's huge for, for human health. And, and the third one, of course, that becomes obvious in this conversation is the microbiome. We know our microbiome can take care of a lot of the toxins we're exposed to on a daily basis. And that's why a, a microbiome rebalancing strategy seems to be pretty obvious in any, any form of detoxification. So what, what does this microbiome balancing look like? And while we're here, Let's go ahead and go into a really hot topic that's going to really, you know, trigger some people here. The carnivore diet, is that helpful? And um, why do some people do notice that when they first take it or they do that diet, they feel so much better, less inflammation in the body, um, and then they become, you know, carnivore advocates. Long term, what is this doing to the microbiome and what is it doing to their ability to remove toxins out of the body? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So the carnivore diet is one of those um, narrow-sighted approaches, and you will see some benefits that you can see actually from any elimination diet in, in the world, uh, because you're reducing the intake of certain things that we know for sure are inflammatory, and they're really not good for, for our health. And that includes, of course, uh, seed oils and high uh, content of omega-6 that can throw the omega-3, omega-6 imbalance off. Uh, sugars, of course, refined sugars, that also is something that we, we know can hurt uh, our body in multiple ways. And, and those two things combined, where, when they're eliminated, they're or reduced uh, significantly, we can see certain improvements. That, that's undeniable. I'm, I'm not even, um, I'm not discussing that part. But the problem is that the carnivore diet, as many other diets, is looking for human cell nutrition. So is the, the statement is that the body needs X and Y nutrients, and they can be grabbed from different carnivore sources. So we, why we need to expose ourselves to, to some other sources of those nutrients when we have more nutrient density in those type of foods, and therefore our body should be functioning optimally. But it's completely neglecting the nutritional needs of the microbiome. And they point out in a certain way that, well, you can compensate that by eating fruits. Fruits are seasonal. And fruits also, they, they, they grow in certain areas of the world. They're not always available. So the statement is implying that we need modern transportation of foods so it can be widely available across the world. If not, it's only for a certain amount of people that lives close to the Ecuador where you can have fruits all year round. Besides that, everyone has seasonal, seasonal exposure to fruits and they're not hugely available in, in many parts of the world anyway. So that's a flaw because we can sustain a diet in a massive perspective 
thinking that we need a food transportation system to be sustainable. Besides that, of course, there's the, the fact that we need different types of fibers and nutrients to feed the microbiome in different ways and with different, uh, different patterns. And that is also neglected in those types of diets. So, and the statement is, well, but you have um, oxalates or, uh, or a phytic acid, and those things are going to grab nutrients out of the body. Those are defense molecules. Lectins. <laughs> Lectins. Yeah. We know that a healthy microbiome can break them down. We know that every single of those molecules are broken down by the microbiome whenever it's healthy. I'm not saying that people can jump in on a high oxalate and, or high uh, uh, phytic acid diet right away. I'm, I'm not stating that. Maybe some people will do better if they avoid certain foods that can be high in oxalates or phytic acid for a while, or in some cases, maybe permanently. Every single microbiome is different. So we can't put the same diet for everyone and, yeah. and, and think that that's going to work. But we know that a balanced microbiome will break those things down. And also those molecules, they're not always negative. They, all, they do have some benefits in, in the body, like I was mentioning, chelation and the natural chelation. Yeah. So they, they do promote benefits. It's, it's all about the balance. It's all about the amount we're eating the frequency of the things we're eating, uh, because we can argue that carnivore diet is super high in purines and also can drive a lot of inflammation in, in, in the gut mm -hmm. and through the protolytic well, fermentation ammonia. pathway. Ammonia, uh, phenols, um, uh, so many, many, many things really that, that we can find that are derivative of the protolytic fermentation pathway. Yeah. And the, pro the carnivore diet, it's stating that high proteins are beneficial for you without assessing the digestive capabilities of that individual person. Maybe one person will be able to break down 100, 150 grams of protein per day, but maybe another person who has high toxic issues or hypochloridia for other reasons or high stress levels that is blocking the balance of the autonomic nervous system will not be able to break down those foods in such an efficient way, and it will drive accumulation of those in different stages of the digestive tract. Now, these foods, instead of getting absorbed, especially proteins, now we're getting them fermented. And protolytic fermentation in high amounts is the initiation of a million types of inflammation um, uh, uh, pathways in the body is 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 a is a huge inflammatory factor, so we need to be careful. Yeah. So so just to those listening are not sure what he's referring to. There's proteolytic and there's sacrolytic. So we want to just quickly uh, just explain what that is. Yeah. So the, um, the fermentation occurs in the body in different stages. And we, we are a massive machinery for um, fermenting carbs, complex carbs, so fibers, all these fructo oligosaccharides, all, all, uh, silo oligosaccharides, all these different types of complex carbs are fermentative uh, foods for the microbiome. And 70% of our microbiome approx approximately the relies on those foods to be able to ferment and then produce the things we need to be healthy. So we need that pathway. And the, that's why we have the, the large intestine. The large intestine is a huge factory of fermentation. We produce a can of beer in terms of alcohol by the alcoholic fermentation every day. We, we are fermenting uh, massively there. But also we have the small bowel. And the small bowel is more related to the protein absorption and fat management. And really we don't need to ferment those foods because they're available to be used by our cells when they're broken down in little pieces, amino acids. And now they can cross the epithelial barrier, they go inside the body and we can use them. But that, that only happens if we have enough stomach acid and enough enzymes to break them down. And a lot of people are not able to produce those in optimal levels for, for many, many factors. And if that doesn't happen, 
now they get moved into different stages, later stages on the digestive tract, and they start being utilized by certain bacteria that can actually ferment them. Now, that actually happens in small amounts and is healthy for us. But when that gets amplified and we start fermenting too much proteins, we start making too much of these byproducts out of this fermentation process. And that's when we start getting inflammation. Because unfortunately, all these byproducts made out of the protolytic fermentation in high amounts are inflammatory by definition. Uh huh. That's the key. That's the key. So that's why, you know, going back to what we we're just talking about, a diet just of meat. Well, first of all, you might not even have the digestive capability to break it down. So let's just go upstream. There's there most people have some form of dysfunctional digest digestive capability to even properly break down the protein. And then you add on top of it the fact that the proteolytic fermentation, if it's predominant, which we see a lot, then you're going to actually have more inflammation just by having more of those microbes available. Yeah. So okay, so now you guys know why we're where I, I know this is where I stand. I've been very, very uh, transparent about this from the beginning. And now you're hearing it from a gut expert. So let's go into obesity. Um, this is a really hot topic as well. Um, I don't think up until the last maybe 10 years, people really talked about obesity and the microbiome. I think traditionally in the 80s and 90s, even in parts of 2000, we're worried about calories in, calories out. And now we're realizing that was not really um, good advice to give people. Uh, eat less, exercise more. To some, to, to some respect, it's actually better to get healthy. And so the microbiome is tightly tied to um, satiety, to um, energy production, um, leptin, um, and even just weight loss resistant. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, so, how, so let's talk about that. So tell me what you know about obesity and the microbiome. Oh, obesity is a huge topic um, because it's a consequence. It's a consequence of hypertoxicity that can come from two main sources. And, and this is a little bit different from the standard narrative that uh, you eat too much sugars and, and you get obese. In, in many cases that can happen, but actually because sugar can amplify the toxicity issue in the body. But the accumulation of fats uh, happens for, for many factors which are modul modulated by the microbiome and also related to the toxicological pathways we have inside the body. Um, fat is the main storage for toxins and the body will make more fats if we have more toxins that we have to accumulate because we can't deal with them in a, on a daily basis. If the body can't handle something and it can create damage when it's handled, it will prefer to put it in, in a place that it will not create so much harm. And that actually happens to be the fat tissue. That's why we have a lot of accumulation also in the brain because those uh, cells in the brain are heavy and content of fat as well. So there's a correlation between those two things. And the microbiome also, depending on the balance, will promote the buildup of more lipopolysaccharides, LPS, which is a molecule that is naturally occurring on the membranes of the gram-negative cells. So whenever we have a certain degree of balance in the microbiome, we have a certain amount, a certain abundance of these gram-negative bacteria which we have, but just by clarifying that, we have two types of bacteria that we can classify looking at their cell membrane. One, they're called gram-positives because they can get stained with a certain tincture in the lab, and the other ones which are gram-negatives, which they're, they're not able to be stained because of the difference that they have in the cell wall. And some examples just are E. coli is gram-negative. Exactly. And then strep is, is gram-positive, gram yes. So th that's this is the way that they were differentiating differentiating uh, cells in, in in lab cultures, like from I'm talking about 80, 100 years ago in labs, and that stays is kind of like our gold standard. But now we know that those uh, gram negative types of bacteria, they do have something in the membrane that is called lipopolysaccharides, and those lipopolysaccharides they do have a function. So they're not just all bad, but also they can drive inflammation when we have too much of them. And our cells are dying, our bacteria are dying on a frequent basis. And every time they die, they release these lipopolysaccharides in the, in the environment. And they're supposed to be managed and handled and eliminated from the body by certain pathways 
that when those pathways are not working properly or and we have too much release of lipopolysaccharides because we are we have an imbalanced microbiome then we start getting in trouble and as and, and i remember you 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 interviewed karen uh, in the past uh, karen christian yes yes, yes. Kar so, karen, yep. karen, karen, yes and he all, he said this multiple times in his talks that uh, there's significant research, a meta-analysis done, done, that the the lipopolysaccharide expression in the body is one of the most significant drivers of chronic inflammation and therefore any type of illnesses associated with inflammatory conditions. Wow. And we know obesity is one of them. So it is really one of the main root causes of chronic uh, inflammatory diseases. And we know we're talking about a huge spectrum of diseases here. So we know that the balance is, is crucial for, for all these aspects. And uh, obesity will be a result of those high inflammatory conditions that we can hold in the body. Now, there's also some bacteria in the body that they like or they're more able to grab and produce calories out of certain, or certain foods. And we know that the, the group that is called Firmicutes, which is a big group in, in the body, whenever it's too abundant, it can actually increase the calorie um, buildup that will create insulin elevation that will drive inflammation in the body leading to obesity. So we know that the balance of those Firmicute groups in, uh, inside the body can actually be an indicator of if the if if the person is going to be obese in the future or not that's crazy you know um i struggled with my weight most of my life and i have a high level of firmicutes sebectoides and mm -hmm. um you know that's really amazing so basically in a nutshell if someone has an imbalance and they have a very high proportion of firmicutes sebectoides they may be extracting more calories from their food is that correct yes so you basically eat the same amount of calories as somebody who has a higher bacteroides ratio and you actually put on weight and they're not. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that, that wow. can happen within balanced microbiomes. You can drive the calorie harvesting process in one direction or the other. And interestingly, lifestyle habits like our diet and other things that we do on a daily basis that we know they're healthy. Um, they can actually dictate the patterns of growth of these bacteria, so we can have a balanced um, ratio of them inside the body or not. Um, antioxidants, we know antioxidants are huge for balancing the Firmicute bacteroides ratio, so the populations of Firmicutes to normal levels. Um, digestive efficiency is another huge one. If we are more efficient, if we are less stressed, if we have better life daily life practices in our life and we're breathing properly and we're sleeping properly we know those ratios are going to get corrected probiotics and other other strategies in terms of supplements can also help uh, it's, uh, something we can talk about so um so you're saying basically um getting enough sleep um, fixing your circadian rhythm waking up at a, at a reasonable hour going to bed at a reasonable hour having less stress Overall, also having less stress during meal time yes. will improve your um, ability to digest. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's huge. Um, from the moment we start chewing the food, we start sending signals to to our, our gut. Actually, before that, by smelling the foods and looking at the foods, we start a stimulatory process that will drive the gut into a more efficient uh, pathway to more efficient processing of the foods we're eating. Now. There's a, a problem now nowadays because we don't have time for eating. I, mean, I, I, I remember when I arrived into the United States and, and, and there was something that caught my attention right away uh, when I got my first contract in, in the clinic I was working. Most of the places that, that they will hire anyone, they don't establish a meal time. You don't have a lunch break. You just eat on the go, like if you have some time. So one of the most fundamental pieces of human health is completely neglected. 
just because it's probably a waste of time and not efficient. And and at, at the end, lunch break and bathroom breaks. And bathroom break. Just, <laughs> I'm so happy you mentioned that because <laughs> you that's don't another the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's it's like like you have to apologize for doing those yeah. things, and um, and those those are huge. So and and then imagine the amount of like medical licenses, the absence because of illness that can be avoided just by giving not even an hour, which is something that I will say that would be great, but it may be 30 minutes a day that you can get for having a proper meal and eating that meal with enough time. Um, in most of European countries and in where I came from in South America and Chile, we have an hour break and we're not lazy. This is not about laziness. It's because we embrace that that's something that is um, is uh, part of, 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 of human health is highly needed. If you don't have that time, you enter into a fight or flight mode. Nobody digests properly on fight or flight mode. We need to balance our autonomic nervous system so it will signal the gut, it will signal the stomach to produce the things that we need to produce to break those foods down. And then on the top of that, we have carnivore diet promotion or other types of diet being promoted. And there people are being told, hey, you're going to get healthy because of doing, because you're doing this. And these people are running between the office work and trying to grab something to eat. And now they're putting, besides all that, 100 grams of, of protein in their diet. That's really the setting the perfect storm for, for illness. That's not going to be healthy. I'm not saying that eating... A, donut is going to be healthy either uh, of course we're, we're try, trying to get, grab some balance but i i believe that we need to just um clarify that if we don't have the time it's better to lower the amount or just even skip that meal and eat whenever you have the time for and hopefully you will have some time later on during the day because um i think that that's one of the most fundamental problems we have right now I'm really glad that you brought this up. And this is an area that hasn't been brought up very often in many of my interviews because we're so focused on the nuances, right? The details, the microbiome with the probiotics or you know other interventions, but the fundamental one is really to sit down and uh, eat your meal. And um, you know, my, my fiance, Terry, um, he I'll be playing this for him later. He um, he takes a long time to eat. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I admire it because, um, you know, he doesn't want any distractions. He's just sound when there's no noise. And I will literally be, I'm not going to lie. I eat really fast. Okay. I wolf down my food and I go upstairs and get my work done. And I come down an hour later and there he is still sitting there. And I'm like, wow, that's really admirable. But you know, at the end of the day, he also doesn't have any gut issues that, you know, like that's related to that. And maybe there's other things going on, obviously environmental things that we can't control as much, but that's something you can control. And so this is why this is a really important conversation. There are things that are not under your control. For example, yeah, your air might be toxic or your water, yeah, you can control to some extent, but these are harder to, to modify. But what things you can modify is what he just said, to slow down, um, relax, because eating is a parasympathetic activity, not sympathetic. If you're stressed when you're trying to eat, think about, well, you know, eating and reproduction are put on hold when there's stress. So those are like things that you have to think about, like, you're not supposed to be stressed when you're eating, just like you're not supposed to be under a lot of stress to reproduce. Same thing here. So wait until there's a better time for you to eat. Skip the meal. It's okay to skip the meal, you know, or maybe have a drink or something, you know, if you're thirsty, a lot of times people are thirsty instead of hungry too. That's a whole nother topic of conversation. But so he's basically saying very, very basic stuff that I think we are forgetting because we are a society of work, 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 work. I mean, this yeah. is really true. And I'm glad to hear from somebody from South America to say this, like he's coming from another country and he's looking at us in America and saying, what is this? This could be really a game changer. Yeah, I think it is. Um, I, I think that that's, that's something that can predict health in multiple ways. Uh, be, because at the end, no matter how many pre-probiotics or symbiotics or whatever products we have out there that don't, that I know they can be beneficial for for a lot of people. Um, no matter how many of them we have available, if we're not taking care of the fundamental pathways 
that we're feeding our cells and our microbiome all together, it's not going to work because you're not going to be able to modulate the changes inside your body. You need to provide the right ecological conditions. You need to provide the right ecosystem for those microbes to thrive. And again, that's not going to happen unless you give that time for your foods to be shooed and processed and broken down so they can be passed either to your inside your body or to your microbes and they have the time to be able to be utilized and and that's the point and on the side and so this is the last part of this if you have inefficient digestion you create more hypertoxicity from endotoxemia problems mm. everything that is not properly managed can be turned into waste and, and on like acid proteins too oh, proteins a lot. The immune system, yeah. But we know prote proteolytic fermentation, it is is a putrefica putrification process. Right. It, it it will create a lot of gases. Yeah. Putrescine, cadaverine, we know those ammonia, the um uh, polyamine, sorry, derived by products, and they're very inflammatory. And we know them, do you know where from from where we know them as well? From root canals in the mouth. That's right. So those, we find them also from anaerobic bacteria that were being held in root canals. Uh, and then when they extract those, those root canals, they, they, when they have been tested and they check and they have all these polyamine production, okay. all these other. So we know that, that there's um, uh, destruction and inflammation of tissues by overproduction of those gases. Unbelievable. And there's so many people who have, I mean, that's a whole nother topic of conversation. There's people who've got like seven or eight of those in their mouth. Oh yeah. my goodness. That yeah, is unbelievable stuff. Uh, well, okay. So we know that, that we're doing things that are detrimental, but the things that we can control is sit down and slow down and eat your food and don't rush. Don't eat in the car. Don't eat on the go, you know, um, all those things. So now antibiotic overuse, this is another one that I know I grew up in the antibiotic generation. Uh, you're sick, you get to take an antibiotic. Um, I look back and, you know, obviously it wasn't under my control, but I'm sure my parents regret it. And I know that as a mom, I would never put my kids through that now, now that we know what we know. So can antibiotic overuse, um, well, obviously we know it wrecks the gut, but what does it do to things like overgrowth of things like clostridia? Um, and then the diversity obviously is obvious. Um, what about mold and candida overgrowth? Is that related? Like, why are we seeing such a widespread increase of yeast in the gut? Yeah. Oh, well, that, that, so many topics there. I uh, Let me see if I can summarize a, a couple of ideas here. But um, antibiotics, by definition, are toxic. And they do not only affect our microbiome. They affect also the mitochondria in our cells. So they will lower the count of mitochondria we have inside our cells. A, a, a cell, a human cell with a deficient amount of mitochondria is less efficient, period. Can't produce enough energy to perform optimally. If you have, if you have organs with antibiotic use uh, or cells affected by antibiotic use, you will have less efficient organs. And then we start seeing hypochloridia start seeing like liver issues, kidney fa failure, and all those things because we're affecting in multiple ways the way those organs uh, are performing. Now, of course, also we affect the microbiome. And when the microbiome receives these antibiotics, and antibiotics, to get this straight right away, is not only the capsule, the pill you're taking from a pharmaceutical company. Those herbal, botanical-derived antimicrobials are antibiotics. And I you guys hear I, that? Huh? You might as well repeat that one more time because there are people listening who work with functional medicine doctors and they put them on, you know, um, I don't want to name names, but certain product lines that are herbal and they have things like oregano oil. Yeah. They're also antibiotics. 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 They're this, we try to disguise them like botanical antimicrobial, biofilm disruptor, they're antibiotics, period. And, and I've seen this multiple times when I test for uh, microbiome analysis, and I see the before and after using botanical antimicrobials 
and the diversity levels drop down in the same way or sometimes even more because they're used for an extended period of time. They're not limited to one week. That will be a standard 10 days, standard treatment for anti with antibiotics. They're used for a month or two or three. And I see levels of diversity dropping down to critical amounts. I'm talking about uh, a depletion in the microbiome diversity that is significant, even correlated to chemotherapy in some cases. And I'm not exaggerating. This is, I, I've seen more than 2,500 metagenomic analysis in my life. So I know the trends and I know what's going on. So I, I don't justify the use of any antimicrobial. That is really any good side. information that you're sharing with this audience, because I think a lot of them believe that when you go and do the botanicals, that it's safer for you. And um, you're basically telling us that it's not very different than taking a conventional. Now, will there still be destruction to the my, uh, mitochondria in the same manner, or is it more so just the microbiome with the botanicals? The botanicals are less toxic uh, for other structures. I, I know that. That's the only probably advantage that, that they have shown less toxicity, le less mucus forming agents than than the standard antibiotics. But still, you're damaging the fundamental piece of, of our biology, the microbiome, no matter what. And, and the problem when that happens is, of course, when we drop down our diversity, we drop down our resilience. And the the in opposition, people will say, but but I feel so much better now because I took antibiotics and or antimicrobials and this protocol really worked. My symptoms went away. Yes, sure, it went away because the communication pathways between the microbiome that now got killed massively and the immune system, which is relying on those microbes to do something about what's going on in the body. So we're not treating the root cause is suppressed because you kill those microbes. Now you don't have communication. The immune system will not move a finger without the information coming from the microbiome. And therefore your cytokine release and everything else that can cause symptoms will go away. But are we treating the root cause by doing so? We're not, we're just suppressing the symptoms. This is literally another way for putting a thionyl or anti-inflammatory drug in our body, but in this way, suppressing the immune activity from the root, from the microbiome activity. And you feel better for a while because later on, because this, the root cause problem still is there, the, there's going to be a, a regrowth, a reappearance of these symptoms. And now it's going to be actually way more stronger yeah, I've experienced this with my UTIs. Uh, when I had really bad chronic UTIs a few years ago, uh, I definitely experienced this. It was almost like when the infection came back, it was coming back with a vengeance. Yes. And and there's another problem that we're creating more aggressive patterns of bacteria. Mm -hmm. They learn. They get killed. Some of them, not all of them. The ones with, which will survive, they will learn through this process. So the second round, the third third round of antibiotics is going to be less effective and those bacteria are going to defend way more aggressively than the first time. There's even viral implications. We know that viruses, phages, they control bacterial populations and they are literally counting how many of those they have because they need them for sustaining the, the, the presence of them inside the body. Now, if you kill those bacteria, up to a certain amount, these phages can actually trigger genetically more aggressive patterns inside those bacteria, though they will become more aggressive. So the body is literally sensing what's going on and is checking for these damaging factors coming from the outside, and it will act accordingly. So the conversation, is, I don't think is about killing microbes or getting rid of these pathogens, which pathogens are just bacteria that they found an opportunity, and they're not really the root cause of the problem. The conversation comes with what's going on in the environment? What happens in my ecological terrain where my, I'm holding all these microbes? They're becoming more aggressive. They're not functioning properly. They're not doing the things that are needed to be done. Microbes are not willing to hurt anyone. They're just there functioning and they will adapt 
you give them a nice environment? You need to give them the food they need. You give them a less toxic environment to survive. They will respond accordingly. Same with the conversation with biofilms. We're disrupting biofilms because we think those are the root cause of the problem. Biofilms are just creating things for us or against us, depending on how we're treating them. We can have very friendly biofilms if they're well-fed, if they're comfortable, or we have a very aggressive biofilm if we're putting antimicrobials every single time or we're loading the environment with environmental toxins, plastics, heavy metals, et cetera. Wow. So biofilms, biofilms are a hot topic. And um, so in the UTI community, um, there is um, a bunch of practitioners that are treating um, the UTIs, um, the women with the chronic UTIs, they're calling them embedded infections. And they are basically being trained to basically address these biofilm problem that they're basically saying that you have an embedded infection in the lining of the bladder. They're calling it a chronic embedded infection. That's a term that they're, they, they termed it. And they're giving them a very strong biofilm disruptors and some medical doctors, even there was actually one in the UK. He was putting people on years and years and years of long-term antibiotics, a combination of oral, but also installations directly in the bladder. And it's interesting about this conversation that you just brought up because um, many of these patients are not getting relief from their symptoms. Yeah, but biofilms are the fundamental structure where all these microbes are functioning. I mean, planktonic bacteria, which are these bacteria floating around alone, um, are not the ones which are really making things for us. It's when they organize themselves in biofilms that they start working in collaboration for making things happen. So biofilms actually are fundamental for us, for our health. We need them. The problem is that because they are so resilient, they're so efficient in communication, they're not like us. They, they are very, very generous. They, they share information all the time. They are willing for more of those microbes to know better, to handle things. That's the symbiogenesis that I think Kieran talks about a lot. So that yes. so, um, you want to just quickly just explain um, what, what, you're, what you mean, because I think a lot of the people listening are kind of new to this whole idea of forum sensing and all that. So the microbes communicate with each other. They talk and, and oh. they can cross. And we have to get one more generation to create this uh, genetic adaptations they can cross, they can transfer transfer the information transversally. So the same generation can learn from others without having to have a, an offspring that gets this information afterwards. So the, there's uh, mechanisms like gene switching and swapping that they use to pass information rapidly. And the quorum sensing, uh, sensing system is fantastic because it has a hierarchy level, has an outer layers and inner layers that they're established and they have certain patterns that with different functions. So there's a co whole community with a huge organization uh, system that allows them to function in the way they should. Now, again, you make the environment aggressive you know, or not benign for them, they're going to respond and they're very efficient. That's why they have demonized the biofilms because they are really hard to control when they're off balance. But the problem is that we can be always disrupting them on a frequent basis because we are disrupting the funda fundamental piece that makes all the microbiome work. So what we can do is actually change the environment. If we bring back balance in the environment, those biofilms are going to get readjusted and now they not, will not longer be aggressive as they were before. B -B -B. And BB, bring back balance. Yep. What he's basically saying, and those biofilm chasers are listening to this right now, and they're chasing and chasing and chasing and never winning. But I felt the same way with Lyme disease, because I think it's the same thing we do with these infections like Lyme disease. We chase, we chase, we chase, we chase, but we never win the battle. The, mm -hmm. You cannot fight them. They've been on this planet longer than us. They can survive when we're gone. 
In fact, when you die, they're going to still be eating your remnants. So at the end of the day, you need to learn how to create a homeostatic environment for them so that there is happiness amongst them all. So we want to make them happy. And so from what I'm sounding, it sounds like you're saying is to improve the environment. And by doing so, you can modulate the biofilm, can you? So that's the first time I've heard that. So the biofilm can adjust to the environment? Yes, that they do all the time. I'm, I'm rapidly. That's what I'm saying, that you can change the patterns, patterns in, in the organizational structure of microbes by changing your life, by changing your habits, by changing your diet to a more comprehensive, more balanced one. That's when you start sitting for 30 minutes to eat instead of running. When you start avoiding those toxins that you 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 were getting from places you were visiting or just because you, um, you were eating things that were loaded with those, when you transition to organic foods, when you start exercising, all those things are gonna remove things that are affecting the environmental conditions that ultimately are changing the patterns of the composition of the biofilms, you will promote better microbiome balance just by changing those factors without even using a single probiotic. So probiotics can be helpful, but a lot of people will say, well, I've been taking this probiotic that you're people are saying that's fantastic and works so well. And I've been taking that for a year and nothing happens. Well, you're still might be eating pizza and French fries and ice cream. Exactly. Maybe you're, but that's <laughs> yeah. one of the factors I'm mentioning actually yeah. is that you need to make this in a comprehensive way. You yeah. can't expect just the, just the probiotic or the supplement to work. Right. Well, it's, it's going back to the drug mentality though. It's the same thing. There's no difference with the supplements or the drugs. I mean, this, they're looking for this, this quick fix and there's no quick fix. So, Candida and mold. Yeah. And this is another one that I've really, really learned. Um, Susan Owens, who's the um, founder of the Triangle Oxalate Group, and she's big on oxalates, and she's done a lot of research on that. She also talks about candida a lot, as it's not as bad as everyone is demonizing. It's actually a commensal in the GI tract, but it does switch its form. So it does become angry. I would say it's angry. Candida's angry right now, or candida's more commensal. It does switch. Um, and, and so we don't want to go around killing it like we do with the antibiotics. So that's another thing I'm seeing a lot of people are doing these broad spectrum, you know, I guess you can't call it broad spectrum because it's just antifungal, but they're going on these long-term antifungals and the statin, diflucan, and they're, or even the herbals that you just mentioned, and they're on them for like months and months and months and months at a time, damaging to the mitochondria. So we know this now. Um, just like antibiotics, but why are we having such a rise in this overgrowth? Is it going back to what you just said with balance? Yeah, um, there's um, always a competition in inside our body and uh, in outside our body, and this the same way that we have now probably mold more uh, mold overgrowth, and and uh, one of the problems is that the controlling agents are getting killed because we have so many antimicrobials in the environment. So there is a self-regulatory process, but when the environment gets polluted, we lose those agents and this constant fight that brings back balance into the system. So the actually natural competition is very healthy. And we know that from inside our body and again, outside, outside our body, we want that healthy competition to occur. So we don't have that amount of healthy competition going on outside. So we have overgrowth of different things. And I believe that's the reason why there are certain things out, out of control out there that we see so many now uh, frequent seasonal uh, illnesses that we didn't see before. Um, and on the other hand, we don't have too much competition for certain organisms to become more dominant. We do have a microbiome. We do have fungi inside our body normally. And again, it's all about balance. But without the proper diversity and with the overuse of chemicals and other things that can be affecting the terrain, um, and that's I think that those two things are driving overgrowth of these type of microorganisms as well. And the big problem is that we're killing them massively because we don't understand them. We are not able to understand in full. Actually, we understand very little about the role they play in the homeostasis in the body. So 
we feel less guilty to use an antifungal than using an antimicrobial because we know more about the role they play the microbes the, the bacteria in our body than the fungi which doesn't mean they're fundamental for our health we don't know what we're doing actually so we're, we're, we're in the early stages of understanding and we'll probably look back and you know 10 years from now and be like oh no what were maybe 20 years you know i know one role they play is they do sequester metals from the body and so when there is a lot of heavy metals it's actually beneficial to have the candida because it helps sequester the metals and you go and kill them and now you're going to deal with heavy metal toxicity so again we don't believe in going around and killing so we're on the same page here because i always tell people that Um, glyphosate is another one that Kieran, I know, was really hot about in my last interview with him, um, in that he said it's an actual antibiotic. Is it safe to say that our exposure to glyphosate could be one of the underlying problems here? Oh, I, I think that that's one of the, the, the biggest problems we have right now. Um, the glyphosate should be, um, it can be actually eliminated through certain microbial pathways. But the problem with, with, with glyphosate is that it's probably one of the best antibiotics ever made, but also it's a chelator. It was originally developed for cleaning pipes and they stopped using it because it was eating the pipes from inside out. So it was such a strong chelator that they couldn't use it anymore. Oh, they found that it was because it's, uh, the family um, of the of the pesticides, uh, the, the, they, they found that there was an alternative use for that. So they started using it in crops and it was so effective that we actually was, was killing everything. Um, that's why they have to genetically modify the seeds now to be resistant to glyphosate. Glyphosate alters, and, and probably uh, Kiran already spoke about this, uh, alters the chicamate pathway, which is an essential pathway, enzymatic pathway for bacteria uh, to produce essential amino acids. So if they don't produce those amino acids, they die. And that's, that's huge for a lot of bacteria. But the saddest part is that there's a few amounts of bacteria that can actually go around that problem. But those ones are the ones which we really don't want to be having so much in the gut anyway. So it actually kills more the commensal bacteria than opportunistic bacteria. So it will drive a huge imbalance in the gut because it's a strong antimicrobial, but also is more specific in a certain way for those bacteria which are commensal. So um, I think that what we're seeing right now in terms of the drop of diversity in the body and the drop of diversity, environmentally speaking, is coming from the overuse of this glyphosate um, everywhere. And additionally to that, the problem also comes with the fact that it is water soluble. Mm. So it's not sequestered, it's not binded to fats like most of the toxins we know. So even if you're not um, directly spraying that in your crops or in your backyard, uh, you will still get an indirect exposure by the cross-contamination of the underground waters, the rain, and everything else that will also affect organic crops in a lesser way, but still. And imagine the, in the humidity in the environment, now you're dealing with floating particles of glyphosate, which is killing the microbiome in the environment. We know that the air has so many microbes. And that's what I'm pointing out when I'm saying that we have less natural healthy competition. We are inoculating our bodies in a lesser way for, from all these microbes we are supposed to be finding naturally occurring on the environment. And when we start losing that environmental exposure, we lose communication. Ultimately, we become isolated. And that is another huge driver of disease that will affect transversally everyone. Yeah, that's a hopeless case over here. Um, however, <laughs> um, you know, again, something that's not under your control. So remember, 
focus on the things that are, are under your control. And then you can do things to minimize your exposure, even though it is contaminating the groundwater. And I would even bet maybe even the rain. Um, if you go opt for organic and avoid processed foods, this is what basically I tell people like wheat, you know, um, unfortunately wheat is not safe to eat in this country. Um, I know people can go to parts of Europe and they can have wheat safely and they seem to be okay, but here wheat is not safe. And it's mainly, it's not the gluten. I don't think it's the gluten. I think it's the glyphosate. I think it's the glyphosate. And so yeah. I usually advise people to avoid, even if you don't have a gluten sensitivity or you don't have genetics for it, go ahead and still avoid it because you are overexposing yourself to glyphosate. I have let, let, done testing on my own children for glyphosate and I was horrified by how high their levels were. And I know children eat a lot of processed foods. So um, yeah. we're seeing a rise of cancer amongst children as well. It's really scary. So spores, I know you guys want to hear this. So this is the last topic today. Spores are here to rescue you, so to speak. Obviously, it's not going to reverse everything. But this is why I love the spores, because they do help with um, managing the problems we just mentioned today. Am I correct? They're managing. Yeah. They're not curing anything. No, but they, they need to, they, they have a rebalancing effect. So what I like about spores is that they first, they are developed for crossing the the stomach acid barrier naturally. So they're on, in this conversation of probiotics, the, the industry is trying to fight against this natural barrier and this pushing microbes to cross that in a not natural way. We want the, the stomach acid barrier to promote, to make its function. And that it means that it filters whatever is not spore forming should not be crossing that barrier alive. But spores, they can. So they can arrive alive and they can fully develop into a full grown bacteria inside our gut. And now they start sensing the environment, which is really cool. They start checking for all these different types of microbes we have inside, and they can promote changes that will reestablish balance in our microbiome uh, ecosystem. That's for me, the most fantastic um, application of, um, of spores, that they're not invasive, and they're regulatory agents. And, and they are actually mimicking what we were finding on the soil for hundreds and hundreds of years. We, we were able to be exposed to those spores naturally because nothing was triple washed and clean and sterilized like it is right now. So now we're trying to regain that, but not from the direct source because soil is unfortunately so contaminated right now, but we're trying to mimic that process with spores we isolated originally from the soil now they're in the supplement but still they will work in a similar way yeah i love them I and mean, you can cook with them they're um they, you can leave them on your countertop you don't refrigerate them you can cook with them they don't get destroyed in heat um now i do know that a lot of people do not tolerate them um, <clears throat> excuse me especially megaspore so i start them on he58 they seem to do better on the he58 and then we introduce the megaspore um why is it that people do not tolerate the megaspore from the beginning what's the number one reason sorry the problem with um with um with megaspore it's not a problem actually it's because it's modulated changes and we spoke about this die in die off reaction we we have from certain populations of microbes and there's also going to be a certain resistance as first so there's going to be some changes and changes usually imply symptoms uh, because the body is readjusting things every process of readjustment has a, a stress factor going on now some people they go way much easier than others in terms of the changes and modulating changes inside the body. That's our part of our individual resilience. So some people, they will have a huge or bigger amount of die-off reaction, will release more lipopolysaccharides, will have this type of immune reactivity for the process of change, which doesn't mean it's a bad thing for you. It means that you have to go slower. So everyone has to has their individual dosing. And I always say that you have to, you, you can't just trust the labels. Uh, the labels are standardized for in an statistical approach for the majority, but that may not apply to you. Maybe you will do great with half of what is recommended in the dosage, or maybe you need double. Some people are super sensitive. They just need a tiny bit. Some people 
only need a few grains. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and that <laughs> is enough to make the modulatory changes that you're trying to go after because you don't need a lot of it to impact the microbiome because it's all about the message and the communication. Um, exactly. So but I have found personally that the HU58 seems to be very well tolerated to start people to get used to the spores. And then we go up to the uh, mega spore, but slow and slow is really more is not better. More is not better. That's definitely key here. And so the, so the mega spore is um, really their signature product line. And um, it's, it's nice again, like I said, because it does really do um it's not what i tell people it's not colonizing the gut it's gone after 30 days but it's modulating the environment to allow that balance you talked about earlier today correct exactly yes uh, they the the thing is that when h when you use h58 for example that bacillus strain um that you're using just a single strain probiotic so it's less uh it's more specific the, you increase diversity and you increase functionality. You increase the properties of the, the probiotic you're using. And that, of course, will create more chances of having Herx reactions uh, or side effects. Again, it's all about finding your the dosing that you can tolerate. And that happens for everything that we use in, in, in the natural medicine world. We need to individualize the needs and the dosings. Um, so we can combine multiple things, but if I have to choose one to start with, probably will be the bacillus spore, the H58 strain, because that has the most amount of effect on certain endotoxemia, uh, inflammatory pathways that usually are needed to be modulated in the beginning. So we can then amplify diversity and the functions of the other spores. And we can even bring more types of probiotics later on. I mean, I'm, I'm not shy with probiotics. We, I think we should be exposed to massive amounts of bacteria every day. <clears throat> Sorry, in fact, in a probiotic formulation, you have just a few, which they can bring a lot of benefits. But I don't really think that we need to restrict ourselves of using one or the other. We can combine them. It's just a matter of tolerance. It's the same that if you were hiding in the shade for 10 years, and then all of a sudden you want to go and get a, a sand bath for five hours in the beach in the peak hours. Uh, of course, you're going to get burned. You're not going to feel good. So you need to retrain your body to accept what was naturally was accepted in, in, in previous generations that we lost somehow. And now we're regaining that. Yeah, that's great. And you heard it from the expert. Um, so Dr. Mar Margarinos, he um, was the person that I consult with when I do the BiomeFX stool testing. Um, and I've really enjoyed our conversations and I, I, we have a lot of very similar philosophies. So he is absolutely the gut expert. So you heard it straight from the horse's mouth here about the probiotics and about diversity and about antibiotics and antifungals and the carnivore diet. And so everything that I am talking to my own patients with is very similar to what you've been saying. So I really, really appreciate you. So Dr. Magarinos, can you let the audience know where they can find you and um, tell them your website or anything other relevant information about yourself? Definitely. Uh, the main way that you can find me is on my website. Uh, it's revolutiongothealth.com. Um, so there's all my contact information there. You can book an appointment and, and consult with me or find useful information. I'm trying to upload as much as possible so I can I can bring more awareness of all these topics we, we spoke today. Thank you so much. This was a really awesome. Um, is there anything else you would like to share? No, I, uh, I think we covered a lot, but um, just um, take time. That's uh, what I always say to everyone. Take time for doing the changes that you want to, to make for becoming healthy. Take time for everything you do in your life enjoy it, be present in that moment, that will bring so much benefits to everything you want to accomplish. Breathe consciously, eat consciously, sleep consciously, and think consciously. That was really good advice. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions or specific thoughts, or think your gut health might be affecting your overall health, I'd love to hear from you. Be sure to like this video, share it with your friends and family, or leave a comment below if you have any specific questions.
be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any updates from me. Now you can find the link below for my one-to-one -one root cause investigation program. And there's also a link below if you wanna book a discovery call with me to see if I can help you optimize your health and reverse any health challenges you're dealing with. That's it for now. Until next time, bye-bye.